what you're going to be hearing very soon is, is from three terrific people. So we have a moderator who's Amy Markman, who's Director of Sustainability at SBM Management. And she'll be speaking with our two panelists, who's Emily Gove, who's Corporate Director of Sustainability and Training at Building Maintenance Service. There's Emily. And Christina Herrera, who is the Founder and Change Enablement Coach at Christina Herrera Consulting, as well as um, co-chair of WeHub and several other organizations that she's a leader at. So um, without further ado, um, Amy, I'd like to turn it over to you. So yeah, we're here to talk about waste in the workplace. And um, I think we're all pretty aware of some of the challenges that um, we face and specifically in regard to commercial office buildings in New York City, I think we face kind of some unique, um, unique challenges there. Um, I'll go ahead and turn it over to um, Emily Go straight away. We'll just jump right into it. Um, as we go, if you have questions, like I said, go ahead and put them in the Q&A and uh, we'll get to as many as we can. Um, I'll turn it over to Emily to get started. Okay, so before we dive right in, um, I just wanted to give a little background on BMS. Um, we have been around for 35 years. We're a full service maintenance firm with divisions in janitorial security and architectural restoration. Um, we service more than 100 million square feet of real estate across six markets that are on this slide. Um, BMS is a wholly owned subsidiary of Wernita Realty Trust where I sit on the sustainability team. Um, and we have developed our BMS Green Clean program, which is lead well and fit well compliant. And the company is Green Seal 42 certified as well as SIMS GB, which is cleaning industry management standard for green buildings. Um, so uh, good morning to everybody. Thank you for joining us. I'm going to set the stage. I suspect that most of what I'm going to talk about is a review for most. Um, I'm going to provide an overview of current commercial recycling regulations in New York City, who's responsible for each part of the requirements, um, and what I consider best practices for setting up your space for success in terms of waste, um, and identifying some of the common challenges that we face. Uh, next slide. So a quick overview of uh, DSNY commercial uh, recycling regulations. So as part of the city's zero by 30 goal, um, you know, th these recycling regulations have been updated um, in 2016 and then enforced in 2017. Um, so the gist of it is all recyclable material, meaning glass, metal, plastic, paper, and cardboard must be kept separate from garbage at all times. All bins must have a label stating material type. Um, so that means, you know, if you have the recycling symbol on a bin, that's not enough. You have to clearly state each waste stream. Um, all recyclables must use transparent or translucent liners and trash uh, opaque liners. At BMS, we interpret this as clear for recycling and black for trash. And we use green colored bags for organic collection. And the signs must be posted in public areas um, describing how um, the waste should be um, separated and discarded of. Um, just two, two more things before we move on, um, not on the slide, but uh, medical waste, including used COVID tests, sharps, materials contaminated with blood are also regulated by the state of New York and must be hauled by a licensed biohazardous, um, biohazardous waste hauler. Uh, these should never be placed in the regular trash. Best practice is to install sharps containers in um, all of your bathrooms so that employees have a way to properly dispose of these hazardous items. Um, and then e-waste, um, electronic and universal waste, these are also regulated materials and must be recycled by a certified specialty hauler. So we're talking about lighting, um, computers, wiring, that sort of stuff. Um, and then finally, there are existing commercial organics rules for New York City that are um, structured around the size of your food service establishment or food prep area or the number of locations throughout the city. Um, these are mostly targeting retail right now. However, if you have a commercial office, um, if you are a commercial office tenant with a large scale uh, kitchen, um, you're likely um, required to separate organics under the updated regulations. So I would encourage you to check out DSMY's website um, to see if you're covered under, under the current regulations. Um, so, you know, who's responsible for what here? Um, property managers, and building owners are responsible for alerting tenants of the recycling requirements. They're responsible for setting up the base building infrastructure in the loading dock or waste storage areas, um, installing the correct signage in the base building, 
coordinating with the waste hauler and displaying the big decal. Um, the big decal is issued by uh, the city's business integrity commission to the haulers and owners are required to display those in um, the loading dock area. Tenants are responsible for educating their employees, correct bin placement and correct signage on all of the bins. Um, Tenant employees are responsible for correctly sorting waste and discarding in the appropriate bin for the material type. Uh, arguably the most important role is sorting. Um, cleaning staff are responsible for lining the bins correctly, um, training our staff on correct collection procedures and properly moving the waste throughout the building, including correct staging um, in the waste storage area, whether that's the loading dock or compactors or containers uh, to set it up for hauling overnight. And finally, the waste haulers are responsible for sending the correct trucks to uh, the buildings for each material type, not combining these ever, um, and providing the, the uh, big decal to um, building management or owners. So that means if you're collecting organics, the hauler should be sending three separate trucks to your building, one for trash, one for all recycling, and one for organics. So in a perfect world, uh, these are what I consider the best practices uh, in terms of infrastructure setup, um, launching a program, and educating your staff. Um, so think about waste during the design phase. You know, the, more often than not, waste is not considered during a build out, but it's much easier to consult something like the zero waste design guidelines and think logically about how to dispose of and move waste around your space as you're designing it, rather than being stuck with an imperfect system after the fact. Um, procure bins for all required waste streams. So that would be glass, metal, plastic, mixed paper, and trash. Um, three streams. These are required by New York City law, but I also encourage you to consider organics collection. Um, this would put you at a four bin system. Uh, perhaps even consult a floor plan or map out where the bin should go and take an inventory. Oftentimes we see um, too many bins in a space, which can lead to contamination, confusion, um, the use of too many liners, which is not sustainable practice. So sometimes less is more. Um, try to get bins with open tops, not circular for small cans or slits for paper. Recycling comes in all shapes and sizes, and we never want to discourage anybody um, because they can't fit their material through the lid. We want to make it as easy as possible to recycle. Distribute the bins according to the building's recycling policy and always cluster the bins together so that it's just as easy to recycle as it is to place something in the trash. Um, all trash bins should be placed next to recycling bins. Um, we don't want a trash bin over here, recycling bins over here. We want to keep them centralized. Make sure that you're um, evenly distributing them and in the same order in each pantry area. Um, and even if the building allows for dust side bins, don't do it. <laughs> um, they are notoriously the most contaminated stream. Uh, that's what we find during our waste audits year after year. Um, it's a force of habit that people are eating and drinking at their desk and just throwing whatever they've got in the dust side bin. Um, behaviorally, it's much more successful to have employees get up from their desk, walk to a centralized uh, bin system and actively think about where you're going to place each material. Um, I've already kind of touched on the labeling, but you wanna label each bin. That means every single bin, um, post-compliance signage where you have centralized bins, keep the signage simple and color-coded avoid too many words on the sign and make them visual. People respond well to pictures. Um, you know, waste disposal can be tricky. That's why we keep talking about it. So we wanna make it very easy. Conduct a compliance walkthrough with janitorial staff or zero waste experts if you can. Um, this helps get everybody on the same page and identify any areas of improvement. Um, Education. I, you know, this is so, so important. We always talk about education. If you're making a change in your space um, or occupying it for the first time, you have to educate your employees on waste. Um, you could host a tenant education meeting with stakeholders. So, um, you know, your tenants, your zero waste experts, cleaning staff, property managers, we really want to get everybody on the same page. Um, at Bernado, we host annual tenant compliance workshops where we ask a representative from each tenant space in a particular building to join us um, and get everybody and kind of go over, you know, what the current requirements are, what the roles are, exactly what we're doing here. Um, and then pre and post evaluation. So 
you know, work with the janitorial team if they're available to conduct spot audits or provide feedback um, on how the program is working and what contamination they're seeing. This is super helpful for tenants just because the janitorial team is the one who is, you know, removing the waste nightly. Our kind of, I call them like our eyes and ears in the buildings. Um, they can give us the best feedback. Or if your company has a green team or staff dedicated to tackling waste issues, you can conduct an internal mini audit. Um, you can do a full scale audit with a zero waste consultant, but you always kind of want to, um, you know, get some metrics so you can see how you're doing. Um, and then improvement. So using metrics, identifying areas of improvement and, you know, discussing with your employees based on what you found. Next. Um, and before I turn it over to Chris, we'll just, you know, waste is um, challenging. <laughs> it's, uh, there's a lot of things to think about, a lot of people involved in just moving the waste from one tenant space to the loading dock. Um, and so, you know, what are the most common challenges that we see? Um, getting buy-in from the top. This is not always easy. Um, it could be the office culture. It could be the fact that employees simply just want those coveted dust side bins. Um, and it's not always a financial decision either, especially now I'm suspecting that employers want their staff to be happy. They want them to come back to the office and they're not willing um, to make waves. Getting everybody in the room. So communication gaps. Conversations need to be had with all the stakeholders, as I mentioned, um, facility managers, employees, property managers, janitorial staff, design teams. Often waste is overlooked as an afterthought for operations to deal with once the space is occupied. So we really need to communicate openly and often with the right people. And then the big one, as we all probably know, dealing with it in our space is behavioral change is hard. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, if the actual humans in the building are not correctly sorting the waste, the system's going to fail and diversion rates are going to suffer. So how do we change the behavior of our employees in the buildings to get them to sort properly? And that's, I think, the biggest question. Um, so how can change management help us navigate these challenges? I'm going to hand it over to Chris so she can educate us on that. Um, so glad to be here today. Uh, thank you to the rest of the team for understanding the role of change management in behavioral change. Um, my uh, goal today will be to uh, plant some seeds, give you a couple of, of points that you can walk away with and start to talk about with your teams and think about how you can do things differently. Um, I do have a lot of information here. So I will say we will move fairly quickly because we'll probably get a lot of richness that comes out of the Q&A as well. Um, my vision just personally is to, um, you know, approach projects from a human-centered way um, because there is a very, very uh, obvious gap between corporate vision and people-dependent return on investment. And I'm going to unpack that a little bit more for you. So let's just start at the foundations. Why change management? Um, well, to keep it simply, people do work, not process, not space, not technology. You can put all the process maps and flows in places you want. You can have a beautiful space um, and you can also have fantastic technology. But if the people don't know how to actually use the tool, understand what they need to do differently um, or don't care, it's, it's gonna fail. Uh, people dependent return on investment. This is a very, um, I guess, hot line or, you know, it, there's a lot of buzz around this. And the reason is um, people don't usually understand that with every project, whether it's a tech implementation, uh, recycling project, um, workplace refurbishment project, if your people need to think, feel or do something different, for you to realize your overall people uh, return on investment, there is a people dependent return on investment. And so that's where the need for change management comes. I'm sure you all have heard about the adage that 70% of all change initiatives fail. And so that's something that I'm gonna address here because that's just an excuse now, right? So we can't keep doing the same thing, the same over and over and over again. The other thing I wanted to share with you is misalignment to values, vision, goals. It's just a non-starter if there's a misalignment. So when you think about how you're pulling together your initiative for, you know, effective recycling, effective and efficient recycling uh, practices on your sites, make sure you think about this, not just from a recycling project, but 
to a, to a business project. There has to be a common tie between the corporate vision and goals and how the business measures their success, whether that's through um, meeting requirements, uh, through um, savings, whether that's through PR, you know, being a great place to work and why. Um, there has to be a very obvious thread. Otherwise, the more misaligned or the more siloed your project seems, the less support you're going to get for that project and the less commitment. Uh, the most common type of communication is miscommunication. And that's one of my favorite, favorite, favorite lines. The reason is because it's true, right? Um, often we are either missing gaps of information and naturally our brains try and fill in those gaps. And we end up with different stories that we're telling ourselves about why we're trying to accomplish this or what we need to actually do. Um, I'm a huge advocate for ecosystems and understanding that an ecosystem is something that affects the whole, the whole organization. You change one thing that might seem very minor, but it will have a ripple effect throughout the rest of the organization. So I really encourage you to adopt a systems thinking approach to help understand how your project is going to ripple through the organization. Um, and then really taking a moment to understand the change will really help you to have a very solid current state and future state. And the reason why this is important is because Emily mentioned some of those stakeholders that are responsible, property owners, property managers, tenants, employees, the janitorial team, waste haulers, Absolutely, but there are more stakeholders. So we need to have a systems thinking approach, take a look at the whole system to understand who needs to do what, who's impacted, how. So that way we can actually plan and think about this project from an infrastructural standpoint. Let's jump to the next slide. So why does change management get a bad rep? Um, I, I just wanna acknowledge change management absolutely has a bad rep. And especially in some of the professions that are, are more tactile, happen to be less, um, for lack of a better word, light and fluffy. This is why change management gets such a bad rep. Um, we know project management alone is, is just not enough. If it was uh, with just project management, project manage our way through all projects, and at the end, all of our stakeholders will be doing exactly what they need to do differently. And every project will be successful. I'd love for you to think about project management and change management as being a lock and a key, right? You can have on budget, on time, great tools, but you actually need to have the adoption in order for it to come to life. Change management is often thought, uh, thought of as light and fluffy. And I want to pause here for a moment. And when you think, just let's think outside of this context. When you think about training and development and growth as a professional, right? Let's stop thinking about waste and recycling and all that for now. There are the hard skills, which are very tactical. And then there are the soft skills. Now, when you're growing into a position of leadership or people management, you'll notice that there is a focus on soft skills. There is a focus on empathy, influence, negotiation skills. And so when people say change management is light and fluffy, I don't necessarily take offense to it because there is a lot of, of great skills that come through as part of the soft skill side. But there are also a lot of very hard skills. And because of the hard skills, people often get change management wrong because there's too much emphasis on the checklist. Yes, we've now communicated. Yes, I've now made them feel excited. Or yes, I've now done this. It, change management is not a checklist. Often change management comes in too little too late. If you are looking for effective change management, you need to be engaging someone, whether it's someone internally in your organization or someone externally earlier enough for them to spend time and understand the strategy, understand the impact of stakeholders, and then develop a change plan to align to that. 
because a change plan developed in silo is just not going to work. Scale does not equal impact. Um, often I am told, oh, this project is very small. It only impacts 100 employees, or this is only a, I don't know, 60,000 square foot space. It's not like we're talking about a million square feet. None of that matters when it comes to change. The only thing that matters is the impact to the day-to-day -day lives of the employees. If the impact is considered high and not by your standards, but by their standards, then you need more change management and more time to achieve that goal. So it's another thing to think about when you think about your timeline and the impact that might help to inform when you need to start or initiate change management. There are a lot of antiquated change approaches. And by antiquated, all I'm saying is that they're not human centered, right? Um, a lot of them take a checklist approach. Um, a lot of them are very centered in the old uh, industrial ways of thinking that the change manager has all of the knowledge, that they are the expert of your business. They are absolutely not the expert of your business. You are and your people are. And so the newer change managers approaches, approaches that are coming out now are human-centered, are co-collaborative in their strategy development and are more successful. So this is why I say, when people say 70% of all change projects fail, that's just an excuse. And another reason why it's an excuse is because a change project is not just a change project, it is a business project. So what you're actually telling me is 70% of all business projects fail. And that's just not okay. We need to do things differently. Communications. Um, often, change management is understood as just communications. Um, and, and communication plays a big, big role, but it's not change management. It's not the same thing. Um, the other thing I will mention is that often you will hear um, when it comes to communications and change management, they always say communicate seven times. You've got to hear something seven times for it to be digested. Um, I frankly would like to call BS on that because that is the perception of a change practitioner that wants to hear themselves seven times. The focus is on telling, not on understanding. And that is the difference with human-centered approaches to change. The, the focus changes to how do I ensure that our employees understand what we're telling them, not that I've told them seven times. And it requires a completely different approach. And then a failed uh, strategy validation process. That last point you know, really just relates to what, uh, what I've said before. If you get the change management practitioner, whether it's an internal person or an external person in early enough, they can go through your strategy and they might need to do an impact assessment retrospectively to understand, have I actually captured all my stakeholders? Do I understand the impact of everyone? Because a change manager that just accepts a strategy and runs with it is not a change manager that's actually looking out for your business. All right, so I'd like to tie it back to um, some of the challenges that Emily mentioned. And I could talk for days about this, which I know that you can all see through my enthusiasm. How many of you have spoken to a leader who said, yes, that's a great strategy. Yes, it helps us meet our requirements. Yes, let's do that. Let's do this. We want the change, yes. But when it comes to them actually being the change, no one steps up. Or they say, oh yeah, I already attended that meeting. I gave you my blessing. I've done my job. I wash my hands. That's something that often comes up because of misalignment, because the leaders don't understand how this project impacts the rest of the organization and how to think about this project as a business project rather than a sustainability or a recycling or a waste or a zero waste project. So again, it goes back to systems thinking. Now, when it comes to pitch, it's really important that you're talking to people in their language, 
right? I'm sure you've seen some diagrams where there's someone speaking and they look very polished and they're giving great presentation, but there's always someone in the crowd that's looking like, what? Like, what are they talking about? It's because you're not thinking about who you're delivering the message to. What language do they need to hear so that they lean in? You need to make it relatable to them. Align your project as much as possible to business success drivers, to business and corporate goals or measures, and also to individual goals. So again, this is where the relationships come into play. The more you know about your leaders and your employees and your people managers, the more things are going, you, the more you're going to be able to adjust your pitch. And if you are currently siloed and not invited to the table, that's probably one of the first things you need to do is develop those relationships. Another thing I like to, to talk about when it comes to pitch is keeping it real. Often people come across too polished. This is a presentation, listen to my presentation and, and let's just, you know, take it on. This is uh, the corporate language. You just need to keep it real with people. Yes, there is a vision. Yes, there might be a mission statement. Yes, there are measures of success and particular goals you wanna reach. But keep it real and have really honest conversations with your employees. Also, think about opportunities to desensationalize the change. So, you know, Emily mentioned desks, side desks, um, side bin desks, right? Now, when we think about that, it's a norm for people, you know, traditional ways of working, traditional workplaces to have bins, individual bins at their desk. Now, well, let's, let's kind of take this out of the work context for a moment and think about the home. Do we have bins in every single room of our home? I mean, if you do, that might be a little strange in my, in my opinion, but if you do, okay. But most of the time we have centralized points strategically where it makes the most sense in your home. So you might not have a bin at your living room, even though you spend maybe 70% of your home life in your living room. You take your rubbish and you take it to the kitchen, you pop it in the bin. So there are little examples and little metaphors that you can start to talk about just to keep it real. Often we think of the workplace as this ideal, ideal place that we need to just create the most comfort, but it has nothing related to the home life. We need to start to create those ties. And this later on, this ties back to behavioral change. Um, let's talk briefly about commitment. Before you jump into any type of implementation strategy, seek commitment from your leaders. I know this can be tough. And for this reason, you might want to bring on a third party to have the tough conversation if you're not comfortable having it yourself. But outline what commitment looks like. I don't want an email to say, yes, I approve this project. I don't want just one town hall where they mention this project. Commitment looks like X, Y, Z. I need you to um, walk the talk and give them actual examples, real life examples that they can actually be active, visibly active in showing their commitment to this project. This also applies to those measures of success. Identify short-term and long-term measures of success, right? There are those quick wins throughout the project but if you have those short-term and long-term, you're also able to keep your leaders engaged throughout the process because they're also gonna be driving that we meet those measures of success. Creating a compelling narrative is also incredibly important. And it's important to speak their language. And I mentioned that before as well. And I guess the most important part here is co-creating the implementation strategy. In the history of man, there has never been a time where you could just tell someone, FYI, all of this is changing, um, you know, you, you'll adjust. It's our nature to think differently. It's our nature to want to understand why. It's our nature to want to get involved. So get your employees on board 
and invite them to co-create this strategy with you. Because if they're co-creating it with you, automatically you're reducing that change bias because they'll already be bought in. It's their idea. They want to see it come to life. Now, I know we're running short on time, so let's jump to the next slide. Perfect. So the next slide is about communication gaps. Now, I've already mentioned the most common form of communication is miscommunication. But I'll also I've also mentioned the focus on understanding. Don't focus on what you're telling people. Focus on checking understanding, that they actually understand what you've said. Um, systems thinking applies in co effective communications as well, right? And what I want to mention as well is, you know, again, Emily mentioned those stakeholders. I've got an example, a perfect example with my current client who has um, adopted zero waste, an incredible recycling program. However, the design team was not in step with the food and beverage team. And so when they installed a new pizza oven and had individual pizza boxes, there wasn't a hole big enough for employees to recycle. So again, we're asking employees to do something, but their hands are tied. And so this is where even the design of the space has to be well incorporated. This is why the systems thinking has to be well incorporated. And you need to really think about the impact. You need to bring your food and beverage team in. You need to bring, you know, if you have a, a, a charity or a coin charity donation um, or a purging party or anything that requires things shifting, purging, waste, recycling, bring all of those stakeholders together to co-create this strategy together. Now, the other thing I've put on this slide is David Rock's um, model of social threats and rewards. This is incredibly um, effective. Um, and this is why I believe so strongly in change management and human-centered ways of change management. Now, David Rock, um, is a leader at the Neuro Leadership Institute. They study the psychology of change. This is the human-centered way of change. There are things that we can do, actions and communications that we have every single day that either puts you in an away response or a towards response. So with effective communications, you can actually plan your engagements to address the different uh, social elements of scarf, status, certainty, autonomy, relatedness, and fairness, so that you are not saying something that's gonna automatically put people in a threat state, not wanting to hear you. You can actually word your communications and your engagements in a way that touches on those social elements to put people in a towards a leaning in um, state. And let's jump to the next one. Behavioral change is hard. Yes, it is. It really, really is. Now, many methodologies take a very direct approach and that's either top down or top down and change champion up. But I think the key takeaway here is it's not about them. It's not all about the leader or the change champion. We need to understand how humans work in order to effect change. So rather than taking a direct approach where you're going to automatically get that resistance, you want to take an indirect approach that is co-created with your employees. And yes, you will still get some resistance. If you do one more click, you'll see the little resistance. There we go. But you're having a dialogue. And it's important to understand where behavioral change sits. It's in stories and experiences. Often you hear people say, oh, he or she, um, or they had a, a change of heart because you're actively seeing that they're demonstrating different behavior. But that change of heart happens in a changing mindset. And so mindset change is where you're going to be able to drive behavioral change. And it's about having stories and experiences with your colleagues and with your leaders. Now, I know I've shared a lot, so I apologize, I've gone so fast, but feel free to reach out to learn more. This is a recorded session, and we do have opportunities as well for you to learn if you want to learn more about um, more human-centered ways of, of, of change.
Thank you very much, um, Chris and Emily, for, for that. I'm going to jump right into um, some questions. We had a question um, actually from Amy King and the questions that um, I'm going to paraphrase, but just about how do you engage a mixed audience of stakeholders, um, specifically with this question in a hotel setting. But I think as people come back to the office, and I was talking to a client um, yesterday, as a matter of fact, that the way people... Like they're, they may not be in the office 100% of the time anymore. They may come a few times, they may be visiting from out of town or they're, the way people are using the office and engaging with the space is different, I think now than maybe pre-pandemic. Emily, can you maybe talk about how that's impacting what you're seeing impacting the recycling programs? And then Chris, how do we engage different types of users of these spaces and make those messages stick? Um, I think I think I'm, I'm going to go back to education with this and say that at, you know we know that um, tenants have been home for a long time and I think that it's the perfect opportunity as you begin to repopulate your space to relaunch education, um, make the changes that you wanted to make pre-COVID. Say you wanted to take uh, get rid of those dust side bins when people well when you welcome people back, have them removed. And this is now the new way of doing things. Um, I think if you are going to launch organics, um, that now is the time to get that um, set up in your space while it's maybe quiet um, and you know, do all the education at once. It's easier to re-educate on recycling and introduce organics than doing it piecemeal. Yeah, I think, I think to add to that, um, when it comes to trying to understand how, what to communicate to who, um, I'd always go back to um, sit with your communications team and sit with a group of colleagues who are going to help to co-create this, this strategy with you. No one knows the business and people's motivations more than your employees. Your change manager, your change manager can help guide that process. Um, I would always go back to what's important to them. If you don't know what's important to them and you can't make it relatable to them, you may as well be talking to a brick wall, right? And a really nice strategy that we used, right? When we think about the whole person, you always say, bring your whole, your whole self to work. Um, but for some reason on some of these projects, uh, they don't extend to the whole person. So how can we start to teach our employees, for example, how to compost at home? How do we start to develop those habits at home so it's easier when they translate into the workplace? Because your project doesn't only start when you've launched it, your project starts now. And this is where you can start to have that mindset change. Let's talk about the organics. I know that's usually a question that I get asked a lot. Um, and the challenges that um, commercial office building space where maybe some tenants want to do organics, some don't, even if you're not, in, you know, even if the law doesn't cover you, um, you know, what's the best way to roll this out? And I know there's maybe a couple of different options, or if your hauler doesn't provide the service, how do you, how do you kind of manage these competing um, wants and interests in order to kind of further that organics program? Yes, I'm so glad that we're talking about organics because you really can't talk about recycling without discussing organics and zero waste strategy. Um, you know, I'm, we're really excited um, at Bornado. We've taken it all in-house. So we are, um, you know, providing the labor from BMS to connect, to um, collect the organics as a fourth waste stream nightly, as we would all the other waste streams, um, setting up the loading docks to have um, the base building infrastructure, um, you know, um, having conversations with the haulers to um, haul the organics from our buildings. Um, it's really important. I think that the most, you know, the most single most important thing that we can do right now um, is reduce the amount of waste that's leaving our our spaces. Um, I saw some chats come in um, from the Q and A and asking about how do we know uh, where the recycling's going. Um, I think that if you look at the news and you've been paying attention for the last couple of years, um, the system is broken um, and. I think that you know zero waste strategy and and collecting um, you know organics and that inherently will reduce what's going into your trash, right? Because if you're doing if you live in New York City or you work in New York City, 
and your, your recycling and your collecting organics, really the only thing that would be going into the trash stream would be, um, you know, film plastic. Um, and there's ways to divert that as well. Um, and styrofoam, which has now been banned. So, I mean, there's proper ways to divert so much of the waste. Um, and, you know, I think having conversations with the stakeholders, talking, expressing as a tenant that, um, you know, organics is something that you wish to do and starting that conversation with building owners and property managers and encouraging them to um, think about building, um, you know, as a whole, instead of doing it tenant by tenant, um, will create a much more holistic system. Um, and then doing building wide education for all of the tenants and encouraging them to start separating organics. Um, and again, a lot of the same um, strategies hold true for that waste stream as well. You wanna have very clear signage and labels and make sure that the bins are lined in the, you know, in the green colored liners. Um, but I think that we're realizing that while we have to perfect the recycling system as well, really, I do think the most important thing is reducing our overall waste production. Um, and that's kind of our forward thinking mindset of zero waste. Well, talking about waste reduction, I mean, that leads into zero waste, right? Because, you know, ultimately the best thing is to just not generate anything. I think we all know that's not necessarily possible, at least within the short term. Like how can how can you start with zero waste? I mean, what does it mean to reduce? What does it mean to reuse? Especially, you know, when sometimes you may not have the resources or if you wanna use reusables and you don't have a dishwasher, what are some ways that we can still participate as maybe a tenant in a commercial office space or if I'm a landlord, how do I make these things easier for the tenants to do? Right, so, you know, beyond organics, I would encourage uh, folks to think about um, packaging. Um, you know, you can purchase bulk bins, um, it, you know, to use with reusable dishware. Um, if you don't have the resources or, you know, with, we've, we have suffered some setbacks in zero waste with COVID. I'm not going to uh, deny that. People, you know, don't want to use reusable dishware. They think that, you know, even though we know about fomites now and how the virus is transmitted and it's not likely to happen from a surface, um, we are seeing a few, you know, setbacks in terms of reusables. Um, you know, I'm ho hopeful that as time goes on and we know more and more about COVID and people become, you know, start coming back to the buildings that we can kind of um, navigate some of those misconceptions. But, um, you know, back to packaging, bulk packaging. You could also look at a company called TerraCycle. Um, if you do provide snack packaging for your staff, um, they, TerraCycle is a wonderful company that can take back all types of materials um, that are not recyclable in New York City. Um, you know, things like bring your own bag. Um, we, you know, the, the New York City, uh, you know, bag regulation, um, you know, bring your own bag when you go out for lunch. Um, as Amy mentioned, reusable dishware. If you do have dishwashing capability, get rid of the disposables and provide, you know, reusable dishes, mugs, flatware. If you don't have dishwashers, um, you could explore companies like Redish who will deliver reusable containers and cups for your use, pick them up, wash them at their industrial washing facility and then bring them back. Um, another strategy that we have um, worked with tenants on is giving employees branded swag like reusable water bottles, coffee mugs, um, metal straws, and perhaps doing that around Earth Day or America Recycles Day um, to kind of help further engagement. Um, Printing, I, I hope that most of you are already doing this, but printing double side um, and setting the printers as a default, I think that's like one of the first things that people um, talk about, but hopefully we're not printing that much at all anymore. Um, and then if you, so let's think about coffee. So if you are providing coffee, if you have the pods um, or the little packets, get rid of those and switch, switch to a commercial, um, grade brew pot if you can and then the the grounds from that will also be able to go into organic stream um, if you cannot seem to break free of the pods um, and that's a somehow a deal breaker a lot of the manufacturers have take back programs for those so i would encourage um, people to look into that um, two more things about zero waste and then i'll i'll stop but it it's a uh, it's a hot topic um, you can check out the resources at TRUE, that's all caps T-R-U-E. Um, it's a certification through USGBC. And you know, I, I'm a um, TRUE advisor 
And there are amazing strategies within the certification that you can apply um, to your space, even if you don't formally pursue the certification. Um, you know, as a facilities manager or the, you know, the person or team responsible for waste, um, you may even consider becoming a true advisor, which is like their version of lead AP, um, just because it, it really makes you think about um, the different strategies that you can apply to your business type. Um, and then experts, there are zero waste experts in the city. I couldn't do, I've got a shout out to my friends at Common Ground Compost, couldn't do it without them. Um, a zero waste consultant can help you navigate audits, um, tenant engagement and education, signage and label strategy, all of that. So I would encourage um, you to also, um, you know, seek out the, the zero waste experts in the city. Chris, do you have anything you want to add on the topic of zero waste and maybe even to like, how do you overcome that resistance to like when these programs come out, people are used to one thing, you want them to do something else and it's like getting in the way yeah. of the resistance you're talking about. I'd probably say think about continuity um, and living and breathing the program. Um, I love what Emily mentioned in terms of having a branded reusable body, bottle and other items like a you know a metal drawer and all of that, and um, potentially having Earth Day as an opportunity to launch. But I would potentially challenge there and say, why don't you launch on a day that's not Earth Day and make it just every day, but use Earth Day to share some of those short-term measures of success get them involved in the conversation of, you know, because of this, we have now reduced X number of, you know, whatever that might be, or we've saved X number of whatever that might be. So it's slightly changing the conversation from an event that happens where we are um, taking care of our earth and doing the right thing to a, no, this is what we do, but let us share an update. This is what you have done. This is what you have achieved. So that's just one thing that I would probably um, challenge there is that opportunity to celebrate with colleagues um, uh, becomes more of an experience rather than an event. Thank you. Um, one question that Jessica had was about lease language. And, um, you know, is that is that something I know, Emily, you're kind of in a unique position being, you know, with the cleaner and the landlord with the tenants. Um, but you know, maybe either of you can speak to, you know, what types of things can you look for in lease language if you're a tenant um, to kind of help engage or help, you know, bolster yourself with these programs and make it a little easier. Well, I will say that we attach the Renato recycling policy, um, you know, to, to the lease and that in the, you know, one, one very small change that we made that I think will make a big difference in the, um, the janitorial cleaning spec that goes in the lease is that we changed the language, um, and I think it was just one word, but you know, to discourage the desk side bins in all new leases that VMS would collect all centralized bins nightly. Um, if a tenant moving in wants to have a desk side bin, it will now incur an additional charge for labor um, in, in order to, you know, try to make that a little bit of an easier choice not to have them. And when I say that, this is not the type of money that we want. I don't want to charge you for the desk side bin because I don't want you to have them. Um, so it was just a one little tweak um, that we thought we could make that would, you know, make it clear that you are to have centralized dust bin, uh, centralized bins throughout your space. You know, we don't want you to have those dust side bins. Um, and I, I, you know, I, I keep saying it over and over, but I know that there are people on this call that are. Emily, I think you froze for a minute. That is definitely best practice. Sorry, Emily, I think you froze for a minute. Oh, sorry. I was basically going on about the dust side bins and how we don't want them. <laughs> you guys already know that. Okay, Chris, do you have anything to add to the, the lease language aspect? Um, I would just say that the lease language is an opportunity to get that, that um, building rep or owner involved in what you're trying to achieve. Um, again, it's an ecosystem. So if one part of the system is not working you know, towards or is potentially working against, um, that's where you're going to have difficulties in realizing your success. 
Um, there was a question on how often should you audit your waste streams? Um, and I know that kind of maybe leads into another topic that, um, you know, sometimes a challenge is, you know, how to, I guess, meter your waste, right? Like it's not as easy as electricity and water, right? You, you know, it's very, very logistically challenging um, to measure um, accurately a lot of times different ways, especially getting a, a particular like granule granular level of detail that we're kind of used to seeing in some sustainability metrics that just um, isn't feasible with um, a lot of waste metrics. Um, you know, I, a lot of people may or may not be getting things from the hauler, but even if you get that hauler um, reported data, it's still an aggregated full building. So, you know, if you're trying, if you have a tenant that's really into it, maybe more so than another tenant, and how do you get the a level of granularity in order to kind of make those changes or see the impact of any changes that you might be making on site that may not be reflected in that aggregated data? That's such a good question. Um, you know, and that's true. The haulers, when they provide metrics, it's a snapshot of a single night. So it's really a survey. I mean, they just don't have the capacity or time during the routes to, to do much more. So if you rely on the hauler metrics alone, like you said, Amy, you're not getting the accurate picture of what's really going on in your space. So waste auditing is such a valuable tool um, for both full building and tenant specific metrics. So we conduct waste audits um, uh, for the portfolio on an annual basis. That's what I would suggest. Um, and one strategy that we use to provide tenants with um, more granular data is that we, you know, the janitorial staff is obviously very involved in the waste auditing process. We're not, you know, our zero waste consultants are the ones actually sorting through the trash and providing the, the reports, but our staff is moving the waste from the tenant spaces to the auditors. So what we've done is we've, you know, identified tenants in a building that maybe we've worked with before that have shown um, interest in better waste metrics or have a robust sustainability team. Um, and we will actually put a different colored sticker on their waste to identify to um, the auditors that, you know, this is coming from the 14th floor. Um, and then we will give um, that particular tenant, um, you know, their own snapshot of their waste. Again, waste auditing is still a snapshot of one night, um, but it's definitely the best tool right now in the toolbox, unless you want to engage with a zero waste consultant and do a more robust audit, um, you know, apart from the building audit in your space. Um, that's one thing that you could do. Um, another thing is for some of our tenants, we have done, um, you know, spot contamination audits, looking in the dust as kind of giving them um, that oomph that extra oomph to get rid of the dust side bins, giving them um, a snapshot of how much contamination is in, is in those, um, or doing maybe with the handheld scales, um, Monday through Friday, like a five night, um, you know, waste survey of their different waste streams by weight, um, which I think really is a good um, indicator pre and post evaluation. So if you're looking to do something like get rid of the dust side bins or add organics, you could do a five night survey um, with your janitorial team ahead of that kind of change and then reassess maybe four weeks later and see you know what the results are and hopefully it's um, positive. Chris, do you have anything to add? Um, and I, I'm curious too, like how important is maybe some of this data in some of that communication um, for these programs? Um, the, the data is incredibly important. Um, I was just answering a couple of the questions in the Q&A about a very similar topic. Um, there, there is a lot of data that you can pull from and you don't only need to pull data that you're used to working with. There is a lot of data out there that shows um, the value um, of people working for organizations where they're their personal values align to the organization values. So if the employees value recycling and value you know, a better world, but the leadership are not buying in, there's data that talks about talent retention and attraction that you'll be able to weave into your pitch and bring it to, bring it to your leadership. So think about, again, the ecosystem. Think about who you're trying to impact and pull data from various sources. Um, data is incredibly important, whether it's qualitative or quantitative. Thank you. And we're running up on time. I wanted to just turn it over to each of you for any kind of final thoughts or um, comments before we wrap up. Uh, 
Um, Emily, you want to start first? Sorry, I was also answering a QA and a question. Okay, <laughs> I know there's a lot. I want to answer them all too. I know, I'm, I was like uh, typing. Um, I think the main pictures are, you know, definitely perfect your recycling program, talk with, you know, all of the stakeholders, but also keep your mind open um, to zero waste strategy, organics, all of the things that you can do in your space to reduce the amount of waste that's coming out of it. Um, and, you know, just keep communicating. And the tenants and facility managers are the people in the buildings that are going to help um, push for change with building owners um, and managers. So, you know, vocalize, you know, that you want to see organics in your buildings, vocalize that, you know, you want to learn more about, about recycling um, and, and just stay the course because we, you know, this won't be the last waste related webinar that we'll be on because, you know, this, it's tricky and, um, you know, just there's a lot of resources out there. So I encourage you to, um, you know, do some research and, and keep, uh, keep going. <laughs> and Chris, final comments from you? Well, you're on mute. Sorry, <laughs> my only comment is that um, I think this is a really, really um, important topic that we're discussing today. Um, not the change management part, because that part, we've got time, you know, to get it right, you can engage with the right people. But the the zero waste, the sustainability, the recycling, um, you're all fighting the good fight. So I'm just happy that I can be here and I can support. Um, uh, change management um, is definitely a vehicle that you can use to reach your success, uh, to, to meet your benefits, to meet your goals. So definitely start to think about how you could leverage change management within your projects. Great, thank you. I guess we'll turn it back over to Ellen and Jessica for closing comments. Thank you so much. This is Ellen. Um, Amy, Emily, Chris, that was fantastic. I always learned so much from, from all of you. Thank you very much.